Okay, any questions about anything uh, that needs to be answered now? Okay, if not, because, because it's the start of a new unit, we don't have a problem of the day. What I'd like to do is to start us in our new unit, which is our unit on graphs and graph algorithms. And um, graph algorithms are, uh, it, it, you know, it's funny because um, graph algorithms are one of the very important you know, areas of algorithms and computer science and stuff like that. How many people here know uh, a minimum spanning tree algorithm? Okay. Uh, crew schools or prims. How many people have heard of that? Okay, a bunch, but not enough. Don't worry about it. How many people have, know about finding shortest paths in graphs? A bunch, but how many people don't? Okay. How many people know about depth first search? How many people know about breadth first search? Okay. So when I get to the unit on graph algorithms, the students usually think, ah, graph algorithms is easy because I've seen this all before. The truth is I find graph algorithms terrifyingly hard, okay? <laughs> and the reason is that graph algorithms are a very subtle thing, okay? Correctness issues on graph algorithms are ver usually very c more complicated than they look. And so um, what the good thing is we're going to go through over the next, let's say, three weeks, we'll go through a bunch of graph algorithms, how they work. Um, what's... what's turns out to be very hard to design new correct graph algorithms, where I'm going to say sort of, you know, where there's really a, a newness from scratch uh, question. But what is true with a lot of graph problems, in a lot of applications in the world revolve around things you want to do with graphs, and recognizing what is the right graph, okay, to do the right algorithm on the right graph is usually the way that you solve the problem. So it's important when it comes to, to, to dealing with graphs is to understand, um, you know, to learn to look for wh what is a graph, okay? Where is there a graph? And um, what you call it? And, you know, how to construct the right graph so an algorithm you already know gives you the answer you want, more so than designing a, a, a new algorithm from scratch to solve your problem. There's a small number of classical graph problems that solve a tremendous number of applications in the world. And that's why graph algorithms are good to know about, hard to de design, hard to completely understand. But, um, but you know, if you learn to think in terms of what is the graph, you know, th good things can happen. OK, I don't know if that helped you or not. What is a graph? A graph is a uh, thing defined by a set of vert vertices, which we will call V, <coughs> and a set of edges, OK, E, which are either going to be ordered pairs of vertices or unordered pairs of vertices, depending upon whether we want to have a directed graph or an undirected graph. Okay? So basically, you know, the edges of a graph are just pairs of vertices. And there are a lot of things in the universe that are modeled by graphs, if you stop to think about it. Okay? Here we have a road network. Okay? What is the road network? The vertices here are cities. The, um, what you call it, there is an edge between any two cities for which there is a highway between them, okay? Now, this is a road network, okay? What are useful things to do with road networks? Why do we care about the graph that is a road network? Okay, yeah? GPSs. GPSs are unbelievably amazing things. I come from an era where people read maps, okay? And, you know, your paper maps, okay? And, uh, you know, it is unbelievable if you stop to think about it. You can sit there on your cell phone, even possibly disconnect, or if you have a cheap GPS and disconnect it from the Internet. You ask it to find the shortest path between here and your cousins in, in Burbank, California. In an incredibly tiny amount, it will find the absolute shortest path between here and there. And that is an amazing thing. And that is made possible by, first of all, having good algorithms to find shortest paths. And it's also made possible by having a very accurate graph that models what you think you want. OK? So here, the edges are, um, I say, roads between pairs of cities. You, of course, you can have this down to finer granularities of blocks and streets and houses and things like that. Any questions about that? Okay, any questions about road networks or anything like that? 
Yes. Shortest path is not an exponential time problem. Okay, shortest path is the thing that you solve by Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, traveling salesman is an exponential problem. So if you say I want to visit every single, you're, you're a politician and you want to visit every single voter in the United States before the presidential election, what is the fastest way to drive to visit every single voter? That would be a hard problem. What's the fastest way to go visit a particular voter? That one is something we can do quite nicely, and we will look at the algorithm for doing that in here. Any questions about road networks? OK, good. Um, another example of, thing, uh, of a thing that is a network uh, are uh, electronic circuits, OK? If you think this is a circuit diagram, what are the vertices here, and what are the edges? OK? Does anyone have a proposal? OK? What might be a, if you wanted to analyze circuits or on some level, what are the vertices here? You've seen circuits before, I guess, to some of you at least. Uh, someone else, yeah? Anybody with, uh, where are the vertices, what are the vertices, what are the edges? Yes? The edges are the breaking lines and the vertices are the square boxes. So one possibility is you could have a vertex represent a circuit component. Those are resistors and capacitors, okay? Um, and you could have an edge between any two circuit components that are directly linked, right? So this could be viewed as a, as a graph on five vertices, the five components, and a certain number of edges. Are there any other graphs that, would, that might be made up? Any other notions of vertices here that might be interesting? Yes? So another possibility is to have the junctions between um, either com components or, well, I guess this is still between components. Another graph might be one that has the uh, components, the, the junctions be the vertices, and the edges represent a particular component here. Does everybody kind of see that that's an alternate graph? And certain, um, you know, certain algorithm problems, okay, may be more appropriate on one of those graphs than the other one. Does everybody see it? The lesson here is that there's different ways to define it. Has anybody ever seen any graph problems related to circuits? OK, yeah? Kirchhoff's law. How many people remember Kirchhoff? Have you heard of Kirchhoff's laws? OK, you took physics. That was something for solving the voltages and that, how much voltage was used where in a circuit. That was having to do with a bunch of equations defined by, I believe it was, cycles on the graph. OK? And the right graph would have the right cycles for that property to help solve the equations. OK? Any questions? So it should be clear that these can be modeled as graphs. Any questions? What other things in the universe that you guys care about are modeled by graphs or networks? OK, yes. Social networks, you guys in the back are all using Facebook, okay, as we, as we sit here, okay? And uh, what are you do, you know, why are you doing that? Because, again, you are all vertices in the Facebook graph. And there are edges between you and your friends. That's kind of what the social network is, okay? <laughs> Any other graphs in your life that you care about? Yeah. What? Roads? Road networks, I'd say it's sort of analogous to the first thing that we talked about. Road networks are clearly things that are in your life, yes. Air flights. So what is, you're telling me that the schedule of airplanes, okay, are somewhat, okay, um, okay, come on in here and we'll, we'll, we're not going to give them out yet. I know it's going to make people nervous. I'm going to do my lecture first because we got it started. Okay, okay, um, okay, hold on, sorry about this. Okay, so these are here. Let me just make sure I know what's here and I'm sorry about, okay. These are sorted from L through on, right? A tells something, and these are the distributions, and these are for the total scores, right? And that's the correlation between the first part and multiple choice. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so now you have a course, and you have a course, but you don't have a course. Okay, thank the TAs for grading them. This is hard work. <laughs> you two guys go, you wait. Okay. Can you, can you, can you sit, sit here for the rest of the class, just in case?
go get a book to read, sit down, I mean, I'll need you to give it out later. Okay. Okay, good, good. Okay, okay. So, um, okay, I want to do my lecture, and I'm going to try, give me, if I'm not finished by 2 o'clock, somebody tell me, and I, I will then start the giving out process, okay? And, okay, any questions? But I do want to keep going with this. Okay, so what other things are there that are graphs? The World Wide Web is a graph. What are the vertices of the World Wide Web, and what are the edges? What is a vertex of the web? Yes? A web page is a vertex, and the edges are the links. Very good, OK? Um, and obviously, any computer network, which is a little bit of a different network. You know, all the computers, certain computers can, are hardwired to talk to other computers. That's another network. Um, one of, another example I looked at was sometimes when you're analyzing um, computer programs. So again, you guys all know what a compiler is. You know, there's input, you, you, you have a program, and it's, you know, it's got subroutines that call other subroutines, and certain statements are executed before other statements. This defines a control graph, where maybe every line in the program is a vertex, and there's an edge between, you know, if you can go from one line to another. And analyzing what is dead code is a graph problem. Analyzing how do you, um, you know, uh, what's reachable from what is a graph problem. Um, another graph that you know we do a lot when we do pattern recognition things. Often you have gr uh, graphs on items. Let's say, uh, what's a pattern recognition AIE classification like problem? Does anybody? Yeah. OK, so you have a bunch of shapes. Let's say you have an, a bunch of images. One thing that you might very well do sometimes is you want to figure out which image is like which other image. Maybe you've got a program that will decide, is this image, you know, let's say one image has a car, another image, does it have the same thing in it? OK? You could imagine a graph where the vertices are objects. And there's an edge if there's two things that are very similar. OK? These kind of similarity graphs are useful in modeling all kinds of different relationships. Any questions? OK, so graphs are everywhere. Um, and what I want to, what's important to me, you know, if they, what is the, um, an important skill to have out of here? There are things I will teach you you will forget, as proven on the exam, OK? <laughs> uh, there's things, but, but one thing that is important to know is, again, it's l important to learn to recognize what is a graph and, you know, what properties does the graph have? OK? This is a garden variety skill that gets you amazing. It's a simple skill that gets you amazingly far in life. OK? So there's certain properties of graphs that you've got to learn to recognize when you see them. OK? One question is whether a graph is directed or undirected. Because there's different kinds of algorithms you use on directed graphs than undirected graphs. A directed graph, a graph is undirected if an edge from x to y implies that uh, there, there is an edge from y to x, OK? If you could have an edge from x to y, OK, but not necessarily an edge from y to x, then we say that the graph is directed, OK? So let's just see something. Road networks between cities are almost always undirected. Does everybody agree with that, that if I can drive between here and Chicago, you can drive from Chicago to me. Does everybody agree with that? On the macro scale, road networks had better be undirected, OK? Or else there's places you just can't get to, OK? Now, within cities, are graphs, un are, are road networks directed or undirected? You go to Manhattan, yeah? It's directed, right? Because some of the streets in Manhattan are one-way streets. Does everybody know that? OK? So if you're modeling. Um, uh, within cities, you have an undirected graph. Within a, 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 a directed graph, globally, it's, it's this thing. Are social networks directed or undirected? undirected? Well, let's think about this, OK? Is Facebook, Facebook, is Facebook a directed or undirected graph? Directed because of pages. OK. I believe that a Facebook is an undirected graph, OK? Why is it? If I am your friend on Facebook, are you my friend? Yeah. It's got to be a symmetric relationship, right? 
So as in, in the big picture of what Facebook is, it is an undirected graph. Does everybody see that? What about Twitter followers? How many of you have Twitter, follow, Twitter accounts? Okay. Is that a directed graph or an undirected graph? That is a directed graph, right? You guys are free to follow me, and I don't have to follow you. Does everybody get that? Okay. Does everybody get that? Okay. Fair enough. It's important to know whether your graph is directed or undirected, because different graph algorithms apply. Any questions? Okay. Now, certain graphs have natural weights, or have properties where each edge, or sometimes a vertex, has a natural numerical weight assigned to it. Okay? So if we have numbers associated with each edge, or occasionally vertex, that would be a weighted graph. If we have a, um, no such numbers, okay, it is an unweighted graph. Is Facebook a weighted graph or an unweighted graph? Unweighted. An unweighted graph. As far as you know, basically, all Mark Zuckerberg knows is that you two are friends, right? Is there a way that you might have, you know, there might be some natural weight on the friendship that might be an interesting thing to have known about? Yeah? You could be if there was some measure of how strong this relationship is, okay? Like maybe I'm a friend with them, but you know, not really that, that close a friend with them versus, you know, I'm married to them. Does everybody see that? <laughs> you could imagine a weight that would go from maybe zero to one for the strength of friendships, right? And maybe, maybe there's ways of measuring that, maybe not, okay? Are road networks weighted or unweighted graphs? Weighted. What are the weights? So it depends what you want. It depends what you want to do with the graph. The weights are usually about what you want to do with it. Okay? For the GPS, what do you want the weight to be? You say the distance. Somebody else said the travel time. That might be a better weight, right? Because sometimes, you know, on, on the expressway, you, you can't move, right? So, so, so the travel time between nodes, it might be a good notion for a GPS, right? The distance is a reasonable thing. What other things might be reasonable things to have as weights on, uh, on edges for the road network? Maybe the speed limit, okay, if you want to know, you know, how fast, you know, if you're doing this at night or something like that, okay? So um, what should be clear is that there are different weights that you can assign, and the interpretation of what you want to do with that network, okay, is going to be defined by, depending on what you want to do with it, different weights will mean, di shortest paths mean different things. Minimum spanning freeze will mean different things, depending upon what weights you give things. Any questions about that? Okay, yeah? Okay, so you're saying, what does the, the weight do to a vertex? Again, right now in this world, the weight of an edge has no direct connection to a vertex. Can anybody think of a graph where the, ver where the weight of a vertex might mean something? Okay, where you might want to have a weight on, an, on a, a vertex instead of an edge, yeah? Stoplights. Stoplights. So a stoplight would be a junction, and what would be the weight associated? So, so what is true is that, that, that stoplights are a junction, so they might be at vertices of, of this thing. I don't quite know an interpretation yet of what average, that weight is. Average wait time. Maybe the average wait time, so a question of how slow it is. So you imagine that you could imagine if there's a killer stoplight that, that just insists that what won't ever change. Maybe your GPS would want to know about that. And then there would be weights at each vertex and weights at each edge. Okay, yeah. Page rank, so page rank, which we won't talk about in here, is something Google has a way of ranking the importance of each website, right? And you can imagine that for each web page. You'd want to know how important it is or not, how or, or a measure of how important or how unimportant it is. And that's a natural thing on it, yeah. You know, so it depends what your vertices, what types are. Again, depending on what your vertex type is, okay, there are weights associated with it. 
One thing that Facebook undoubtedly knows about you, you are vertices in a social network. I would, I, I'm quite confident that Facebook has a way to figure out an estimate of how much money each of you have. Okay, and that is a vertex, per, and it can be thought of as a vertex weight for people on Facebook. Certainly how old you are would be one thing that they would have an estimate of. Something about how many friends you have is a more direct thing. Okay, that's related to the vertex degree uh, of it. So yes, yeah, so, so friends is probably a more direct thing, right? Does everybody agree that, you know, Facebook might be interested in give me the thousand people vertices of highest degree with the most friends, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Any questions? So when you got a graph, is it weighted? Is it unweighted? There's different graph algorithms for those two things. Any questions? Okay. There is a, a practical matter that's important to know about that well, we, won't, we will ignore in here, but you need to recognize this in some back part of your brain, is that um, there are certain things that make graphs sometimes a little messier to deal with, okay? For example, does your graph allow uh, an edge from a vertex to itself? They call those things self-loops, right? Okay? And you could sometimes have a world where maybe there are multiple edges between two vertices, okay? And so these are complications. Does everybody agree these are sort of un un unusual kinds of things? In Facebook, are you allowed to, to, to be your own friend? So that would be an argument that they don't want a, uh, a self-loop. Are you allowed to have two edges between you and your friend? Okay, it's not obvious that they do. Okay, can anybody think of a graph where it might be reasonable to have two edges between the same vertices? Yeah? What? When you like your own picture. So if you could like your own web page, that would be a self loop on some level. But, uh, but, yeah? Different IP addresses to, okay, I'm not sure I like those examples. Let's go back to our circuit diagram. Okay? Here is a world where if we were modeling this as a junction and that as a junction, each junction is a vertex. Does everybody see that here we've got two edges between this vertex and that vertex? Does everybody see that? So in that case, it makes perfect sense to deal with multi-edges, multi okay? If for every edge in Facebook, there was an edge where you had to describe if there was a friendship, where it came from. Oh, this guy I know because they were in my algorithms class. This guy I know because we served in prison together, okay? <laughs> that you could imagine somebody who you were both in class and served in prison with. There might be two edges between you, right? Yes? Okay, so sometimes what you have are edges, again, in a directed graph, sometimes there are edges but that go between from A to B. In a direct graph, there's an edge that could go to A to B. There's also an edge sometimes that can go to B to A, right? So in an in a undirected graph, if there's an edge from A to B, it's got to be an edge from B to A. In a directed graph, it's not necessarily reciprocal, but that doesn't mean it can't be reciprocal. So sometimes you can very well have these tiny loops in them. Okay, any questions about that? So what is the thing about these? You need to be aware when you are programming graph algorithms whether or not your graph might have self loops or whether it can have multiple edges because that makes your data structures or your algorithms usually, the algorithms we're going to talk about in here generally will assume no self loop and generally assume no multi-edge. You've got to deal with them in an appropriate way. Does everybody see that? If I want what's the shortest cycle in an edge which has self-loops, you may not care about the self-loops. You don't want that, uh, that's a cycle, either a cycle of length one or something you want to ignore. So recognize that, that, that on these graphs, the graphs that avoid self-loops and multi-edges are simple, here, we're going to assume from now on every graph is simple. When you get out into the world, nothing is simple, right? So you've got to make sure that you're aware to clean up your graph right. Okay, any questions? Good. 
A fundamental distinction that we are going to worry about on here, in here a lot, is whether graphs are sparse or dense. Okay? A graph is sparse when only a small fraction of the possible edges, okay, possible vertex pairs, are actually edges in the graph. If I have n vertices in my graph, and it's a simple graph, how many edges can I have? What's the most edges I can have on a graph with a simple graph with n vertices? Okay, if I have three vertices, I can do ka chunk ka chunk, right? Four vertices. You say you're saying it's n times n minus one. Okay, it's basically it, okay. It's it's basically n choose two because any pair, subset of two vertices counts as an edge, right? And this thing is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2, right? So this tells me that the number of edges in a graph potentially grows quadratically in the number of vertices. Does everybody get this? This is important, so if you don't get it, I want a hand up for this. Does everybody see that an n-vertex graph might have n squared edges, big O, theta, theta of n squared edges. OK? Any questions? A dense graph is going to have n squared-ish edges. A sparse graph, generally speaking, will have n-ish edges. Yes? Sorry, I was going to ask if that was the maximum for a graph or a maximum for a sparse graph, or what, what is that? So recognize that a graph, the way I think about it is a graph is sparse if it has, let's say, order n-ish edges. That would mean the average vertex is of constant so degree. The degree is the number of edges on a vertex, right? In a sparse graph, every edge on average has a small number of edges on it. In a dense graph, every vertex on, uh, 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 with high probability you know, has, generally has a large, is connected to a large number of other vertices. OK? So if a graph is connected to, has n squared edges, it is dense. If it is order n edges, it is sparse. If it's somewhere in between, it's somewhere in between. OK? But usually in between is probably closer to sparse than, than that. Yes? So, should it be n times n minus 1? Um, you know, up here I can't tell, but that's why we use the big O notation, isn't it? Right? Okay, because we don't worry about such things. I think. Uh, yes. Does a directed graph? This is an undirected graph. That's a good question. I always should know directed, undirected. This is an undirected graph. A directed graph should have twice as many. And the question of whether there's a plus or minus, I think, reduces to whether or not you're allowing self loops or not. OK? So, so, you know, recognize it's n squared-ish. That's why we think in a big O, big theta world. OK? But it should be that dense graphs are quadratic. Sparse graphs are linear. OK? Is phase, oh, yes? Is there any n, like n log n case? Or are there n log n? n log n to me is a lot closer to n than it is to n squared. So I would be typically saying, yeah, an n, n log n is probably sparse, pretty sparse, OK? Recognize that it's a qualitative term, but it's a big pole of a difference. Facebook, is Facebook a sparse graph or a dense graph? Yeah? Sparse graph. Why is it a sparse graph? Well, OK, it's because basically, well, a couple of reasons. One is I understand Facebook doesn't let you have more than 5,000 friends, right? That's because Facebook, I, that's, I, I, am I right? Has anyone ever heard anything like that? OK, so why is that? Facebook wants to enforce sparsity. OK, that's one thing it's saying. The other thing is, frankly, people don't have that many friends, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, in general, there's, you know, there's, there's studies that show you can only you know, keep 150 people in mind or something like this, OK? So Facebook is a sparse thing, and friendships are probably a sparse graph. Recognize there's billions of people in the world for you to be friends with, and you're only friends with 150 of them, OK? That's a very sparse graph. Does everybody see that? Are road networks sparse graphs or dense graphs? 
How many people say sparse? How many people say dense? OK, good. Why, do they, why is it that road networks are sparse <coughs> graphs? Well, because again, because the main reason is because we live on a basically flat world. That's the real reason, right? If I'm going to have edges go from this junction, how many roads can go from this junction before the road is too thin for you to walk, drive on? Isn't that right? If you go to my web page, I've tried to collect what is the densest in the road network of the world. What is the single highest degree node that any exists? People have sent me something with 12, but even that's questionable. Okay, Living on a flat world where the roads are, and roads are basically a flat world, if, if, if you, know, you can't have too many nodes okay, that are immediate neighbors of some other node. Does everybody agree with that? So that is one reason why road networks are sparse. And as I hope we will see today, and if not, we're going to see it next time. There is a dramatic difference between the data structures you use for sparse graphs or dense graphs. Any questions? Notice that if you use a dense graph data structure for storing Facebook, there could be no Facebook, okay? Because it's going to be a horribly wasteful thing if you have a matrix of 6 billion people by 6 billion people, okay? Most things in the world, if you look at them right, are usually sparse, especially big graphs, okay? And recognizing that is an important thing in graph algorithms. Any questions? Okay, good. Another distinction we are going to be looking at here are um, whether a graph contains any cycles, okay? Certain graphs don't contain any cycles. What are undirected graphs that don't contain cycles? Does anyone know what an undirected graph <coughs> that does not contain a cycle is called? Yeah? It's called a tree, okay? And trees are important classes of graphs. Why are trees interesting? The real reason is because they don't have cycles in them. Cycles are complicated, okay? And that's why when we talk about data structures, we've been happy with trees. That's a large part of why trees are interesting things. <coughs> when it comes to directed graphs, we're going to be talking about graphs that may not have directed cycles in them, okay? So you can imagine a cycle is a path that goes ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk back to where you go from. That's a cycle. A graph that contains a cycle is called a cyclic graph. A graph that does not contain a cycle is an acyclic graph. Certain graphs, by constraint, cannot have cycles in them, okay? An example of that would be like your course prerequisite schedule at this university. Wouldn't it be great if the prerequisite to 373 was 214? And the prerequisite to 214 was 114. And the prerequisite to, to 114 was 373. Does everybody see that this is a cycle now? We would have no CS majors, okay, <laughs> if we had a cycle in this. Does everybody see this? Because you can't take any of these. There's no place to start. In many scheduling problems, for it to make sense, there has to be an acyclic graph. And knowing whether or not your graph is acyclic, recognizing it, tells a clue about what you can do with it. Any questions about that? Okay. Fair enough. One other flavor of graph that I want to talk about here, that again, we won't talk about in here too much, but you should have be aware of, <coughs> is that people sometimes get confused. Sometimes graphs are drawn. And we say, what is a graph? A graph is a set of vertices on and uh, pairs of things called edges. Is this a graph? Well, you say, yes. Actually, to be precise, it's a picture of a graph, isn't it? OK? Because I've shown you the, each one of these vertices look like points or points drawn in a way, right? Does everybody see that? You can imagine that. In, in your computer data structure, there is no drawing typically of the graph, right? In certain applications, vertices typically have positions, and these positions are part of 
what makes the, the, the structure interesting. In Facebook, does the position of the vertex make much difference? Not really, okay? In a road network, does the position of the vertex tell you something? The answer is most definitely it is, right? It kind of defines the distances between things. So there is a distinction between um, what you would call embedded graphs, where there's positions of vertices that convey information, and vertices that don't, and graphs that don't, which I'll say are purely topological things. In here, the algorithm is going to talk about everything is presumably topological. But quite often, what happens is you have a weighted graph where the vertices are points and the weights are the distance between the points. That's a natural thing to happen. Okay? So be aware a drawing is not the same thing as a graph. Okay? But the drawing may convey information that is relevant, may not convey information. Any questions? Here, we're not going to deal with drawings anymore, though. Any questions? OK, good. OK, so um, let's just, I, 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 uh, OK. So you know, again, the example of the social network is a good one, OK? And that we can have a ver vertices where we have people and there are edges between friends, OK? <laughs> Notice that the network here is not necessarily connected, OK? What does it mean to be connected? It would mean that there's one piece, OK? Does everybody see that? Sometimes you have graphs that exist in multiple components here, right? Does everybody see that? Now, what would a, the road network of the world, does the road network exist as one piece or one, not one piece? Within a country, it's ideally one piece, meaning you could drive between any place and, and else. But it's certainly tr not true in the world, right? There's no way to drive between here and London, OK? Does everybody see that? So one property which we will talk about in here is whether or not the graph is connected in pieces, OK? Any questions? And in the friendship graph, do we think that, that Facebook is a connected graph or not a connected graph? Not a connected graph? What would be a non-connection? What would be a isolated components probably corresponding to, yeah? A new user who just signs up has no friends yet, right? So those people are probably on separate components. Generally speaking, Facebook probably has one giant component of vertices. So you, there's a connection between you and Barack Obama someplace, right? But there's probably some isolated places. You know, some, some hermits who aren't connected to very many people, maybe just connected to the neighboring hermit or something like that. Any questions about that? Okay? So we will be dealing with connectivity in there uh, at other points. Okay? So let's interpret it. Just again, to talk about the directed graph. We talk about the social network. Okay? Is the herd of graph, okay, a directed graph or an undirected graph? Have I heard of you? Is that a directed graph or an undirected graph? Why is that? Because I've heard of Barack Obama. He hasn't heard of me. Does everybody see that? Is the had sex with graph a directed graph or an undirected graph? As I understand everything, and again, you know, <laughs> if I do it with you, you did it with me, that would mean that it is undirected. Does everybody get that? Okay, good. Um, Again, we're going to be interested in paths between things. That's why a depth first search and breadth first search are going to come in. Um, we, we talked here, uh, I've used this word, but let me just write it on the board, OK? One term that we're going to be using a lot is the degree of a vertex. The degree of a vertex is the number of edges adjacent to it. Does everybody get that? So in, in, in the social network, it's a function of how many friends you have, right? They're really asking everybody, how many friends do you have? You're asking me, um, whether, I mean, what's your degree? In the friendship graph, you often have um, groups of people who all know each other. So when I was in high school, there was a lot of complaints about cliques in my high school. What was a clique? It was a group of people who hung out together and and they didn't deal with anybody else, okay? 
Now, what is a click in a graph? Okay, you, if you had a friendship graph, what would a what would Taylor Swift's posse look like? That would be a set of vertices where everybody knows each other. Does everybody agree with that? That's a complete graph, subgraph. Okay. So recognize that within these graphs, there are going to be structures of interest. One structure that, that at the end of the semester we're going to be very interested in is whether or not we can find <coughs> dense subgraphs, okay, where um, there's a small number of nodes with a large number of edges, okay? And those typically will correspond to groupings of people naturally, by where they live, by where they go to school, things like that. Any questions? OK, good. Any questions about graphs and modeling? OK? Because, uh, again, you know, if we, this, this is one of these things to start to look out for when in your life you encounter a graph, OK? And when you do, what properties does it have, OK? And, you know, any questions about that? OK. What I'd like to talk about for uh, the rest of the uh, main part of the class, I'd like to talk about um, data structures for graphs, OK? And in a data structure for a graph, um, the, there's two different ways we can represent graphs in a computer, OK? And here we're going to be talking about simple graphs. We're going to be talking about non-topological topological graphs. We're not going to worry about drawings, OK? And they're going to, the two different structures are going to be adjacency matrices and adjacency lists. And one is going to be good for dense graphs, and one is going to be good for sparse graphs. OK? So an adjacency matrix is good for, data, for, for dense graphs. It's going to represent a graph on n vertices by a matrix of an n by n matrix, OK? Where, if I have an n by an n by n an n vertex graph, I can represent my ma my edge my graph by a matrix an n by n matrix, where element i j is going to be equal to one if there is an edge in i j between vertex i and vertex j in the graph, and zero otherwise. Does everybody get that idea? So every edge in a graph is a pair. A pair can be specified by i, x, y. And that's going to represent one cell in the matrix. OK? And any questions about adjacency matrices? OK? They are, again, a basically simple idea. What's good about them? OK? If you have a dense graph, if this has n squared cells. If you have a dense graph, that would mean you have n squared, a, <coughs> a constant times n squared edges. A sizable fraction of the entries will be 1, representing edges. And some, perhaps also an n, uh, a quadratic number, might be zeros, representing non-edges. If you have a sparse graph, recognize that almost all the entries would be 1 would be 0, representing no edge. OK? That's why this would be wasteful for a, a sparse graph. Any questions about that? These should be simple. How could we save space if the graph was un undirected? Here we have an n by n matrix for storing our graph. What if the graph was undirected? Is there any way to save space? Yeah. Right. Does everybody see that in an undirected graph, edge x, y means that is the same as y, x? So what if I only save ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk a triangular version of the matrix, right? Maybe I'm only going to store the values where x is less than or equal to y, OK? Now, suppose I ask where is um, whether or not element uh, 2, 3 is an edge, I would go 2, 3, and I'd look it up. What if I ask whether 3, 2 is an edge? Because I'm only storing the elements where x is less than y, I would look this edge up by reversing the pair and looking it up. 
How many people see, understand what I just did? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so, okay. So adjacency matrices are not rocket science. That much should be clear. Now adjacency, yes? The complexity to do anything with an adjacency matrix is going to be n squared. That is, I guess, an important point. How, do you how much does it cost to initialize an adjacency matrix to having no edges in it? n squared, you've got to write 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all over the matrix, right? So doing anything with a, a, an adjacency matrix is n squared, which is bad unless you've got a dense graph. If you've got a dense graph, then there's going to be n squared edges. You're going to be doing n squared things to it. Yes? The difference between a directed graph and an undirected graph in the number of edges is a factor of 2. That is a constant. 2 times something is the kind of thing we ignore in big O world, right? So I don't really, my world doesn't change too wildly when I think about directed, about d directed versus undirected. It changes wildly when I think about dense versus sparse, okay? Any questions? So an adjacency list is a data structure that um, represents a, um, it's going to be the following. It represents our graph by an array of n linked lists, OK? Where the ith linked list is going to be the list of vertices that vertex i is adjacent to, OK? So if we look here, OK, vertex 5 is adjacent to 4, 2, and 1. Does everybody see that? So if we march down that list, we get 4, 1, 2, end of list. Does everybody see that? What about vertex 4? Vertex 4 is adjacent to 2 and 5 and 3. Does everybody see that? That's right. OK. Any questions? How many times do, in an undirected graph, how many times does edge ij appear in an adjacency list? OK, let's think about this thing. What's the total? Let, well, let's go back a little bit. So let's say that we have a graph, an undirected graph with m edges. m is the usual number of edges in a graph. OK, how many elements to are going to be on these lists in total? 2 times m. Why is that? Edge xy is going to be represented where? It is going to be represented as y in the list of x and x in the list of y. Does everybody see that? So we have a world where, in an undirected graph, there's going to be two copies of every, um, of, of every edge. In a directed graph, there will be only one copy of an edge. Any questions about that? What is the total space in terms of n and m? n, the number of vertices, and m, the number of edges. How much space does this adjacency list take? Yeah? n squared, we don't care about m? Oh, wait, oh, this one. In an adjacency list, how much space will it take? If you've got n vertices and m edges. You say n plus 2m. I say, you know, theta of n plus m. OK? If we have a graph on n vertices and no edges, OK? How many space will it take? It will take n space for this array. And it will take no space for the linked lists. Does everybody see that? Any questions about that? Yes? So if we can detect if we're using a sparse or a dense graph, we should switch between a list and an array? OK, array? if you detect whether you're using a sparse graph, or you better know before you write your graph program. Are you using a, do you have sparse graphs or dense graphs? OK, and you build your graph program and your algorithms and your data structures around whether you're dealing with sparse graphs or dense graphs, OK? And usually from your application, it should be clear which you have. OK? Yes?
OK, so n is the number of vertices. m is the number of edges. In a sparse graph, the number of edges is order m. Uh, a, a number of edges m is going to be m times a constant okay, of n. As I defined it, the number of vertices is linear. You're right that if you have a graph where the number of edges is a constant times n, the total data structure would be, could be said to be order n. Okay? But as I think about graphs, I always think about proving my bounds in terms of n and m. Okay? Because maybe you intend for your graph to be sparse. But what if Facebook suddenly announced you're allowed to have log n friends? Okay? The sparse graph data structure would still work, right? But, you know, even though the number of edges is no longer linear. Okay? So when we analyze these things, we do it in terms of the number of vertices and the number of edges. Any questions? Okay, any questions about how these work? Yes? So if you want shortest path and you use like the vector, the, the JC matrix, if you actually store all the paths to WON cubed space? Um, say that again. So if we want to store all the shortest paths. Okay, storing, oh, let's say we'll talk about Dijkstra when we get up to Dijkstra. That's a more complicated question than I'm ready to deal with. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. So what is the trade off? Who wins in the battle between? adjacency lists and adjacency matrices. Which is faster to tell me whether there's a particular edge? So if I want to know whether you are friends with you, which would be a faster data structure, to have it as an adjacency matrix or an adjacency list? Matrix, that's a constant time operation. You and Vinny, bang, OK? What is the complexity of telling whether you are friends with Cousin Vinny okay, in an adjacency list? It's time proportional to, you go in constant time to your list. You walk through all the elements of your list looking for Vinny, right? That would take how much time in the worst case? O of n. Another politer way to say it, it is time proportional to the degree of your degree, right? which can be as large as n, but typically will be smaller, right? So it's kind of a stronger guarantee. Any questions? Which is faster to find the degree of a vertex? Let's say I want to know how many friends somebody has. Is it easier to do it in an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix? OK, in a matrix, what do you got to do? I got to cruise through all the elements of that row, right? That's order n. If I want to find how many friends who have an adjacency list, what do I need to do? I go through your list. The number of real friends you have is a lot smaller than the number of possible friends you can have, right? So that will be proportional to the degree instead of n. Which is better on a small graph or a sparse graph? Uh, a sparse graph is really the word I think I want here. It should be clear adjacency lists are wildly better than adjacency matrices here, OK, if you've got a sparse graph. If you've got a dense graph, the matrix is going to be n squared. This is going to be n plus n squared. Both of them are going to be quadratic-ish. Does everybody see that? So maybe we could argue that in a big theta space world, there's no difference. In a practical world, there's pointers needed for linked lists. If you really have a, a quadratic number of edges, make the matrix. Yeah? So you're saying, if I really want to be able to look up how many friends you are, can I store that in my a data structure instead of actually counting it? And the answer is yes, of course, if that's what you want to do. That's a perfect, that, that, if you're going to be constantly knowing, what, needing to know the degree, that is often a smart thing to do. OK? Any questions? Yes? Uh, if, if the new horizon is used like a separate thing, for example, of have buckets <coughs> for friends so that we can like, quickly find a friend whose name starts with A instead of like a list for uh, an array. OK, if you want to find what, what's your, a friend that starts with A, again, typically, again, there's always different variations and flavors you can have. 
But generally speaking, there is a vanilla adjacency list data structure that is what I showed you, and that generally is what you want to do. Making it more complicated is generally not a win. Okay, so the, the basic adjacency list data structure that we talk about in here is the kind of thing that we're in, that, 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 that we're typically, you know, is basically good for, for, for the kinds of things we're going to deal in here. Any questions? Which is better for most problems? Okay. Generally, oh, okay, here let's look at another question. To put an edge in a graph, how much time does it take to put an edge, add an edge or, dele or delete an edge in an adjacency matrix? How much time does that take? One for, just flip a bit, right? How much time does it take to delete an edge from an adjacency list? Order the degree of the two vertices it's adjacent to. If I have to delete x, y, I've got to delete my y copy from the list of x and my x copy from my list of y. Does everybody see that? So I have to walk through that more than times. What if I want to visit all the edges of my graph and just say count how many edges there are in my graph? In an adjacency matrix, I've got to look at all n squared elements to count the number of edges. In an adjacency list, how do I count the number of edges? OK. I go down 4i equals 1 to n, the number of vertices. Do a walk through each list and count to the end. Does everybody see that? I can do, take a, at least a glance at every single edge in an adjacency list in n plus m time, okay, which is better than for an adjacency matrix. Any questions? So bottom line, which is a better thing on most problems? Should we be dealing with adjacency lists or adjacency matrices? Almost always in your graph, your graphs will be sparse. Either they're going to be tiny and it doesn't matter, meaning small numbers of vertices, or they're going to be very sparse. So almost always adjacency lists are the right thing to use. OK? Any questions? Yes? Uh, regarding the factor to find vertex degree, in the worst case scenario, it doesn't have to always be lists, right? Like, what if it's a dense graph and it's, you have to do all n? It's the same as this. To find the degree, in the worst case, finding the degree, if I have my degree, if I am friends with everybody, then it will take n steps to hop through the list. The degree of a vertex is always less than or equal to the total number of vertices if the graph is simple. So we would say that you win with the adjacency list. Any questions? Any questions about these data structures? OK. Because of the timing, I'm not going to get a chance to go through the code-like thing. Do look at the implementation. For the next homework, don't go anywhere yet. Sit down. You've got plenty of time. OK. Do look at the implementation. For your next homework, you're going to have to program a tiny little graph algorithm. And you really have to understand the basic mechanics, be comfortable with, with the basic mechanics of working with these lists and matrices. Any questions? OK. Huey uh, Dan, come on down now, you. OK. Now, this is how we're going to give these things out. I want you guys to do the following, OK? A through, um, what you call it, A through um, K. I want you guys to sort yourselves, don't anyone move yet. People A through K, sort yourselves by name over here. The A is ahead on the list. People L through Z, sort yourself over here with the L's down here. OK, last names. OK, now. Once they finish settling themselves in, I'm going to want you to go through the list and get them out in order. They, these people are going to be sorted by name. So you read the name. Which one do you want to do, the A's or the? You do these, OK? So I want you to go. You'll read the name and just pass it out and get people to move, OK? Don't give it out yet. Let them finish sorting. OK. So. Um, OK, so the grade distribution, get yourself sorted accurately by name. OK, uh, from 1 to 10 on the test, they were 5. 
11 to 20. Zero. 21 to 30. Three. 31 to 40. Okay, I have 10. 41 to 50. To 50. There were 41 people. 51 to 60. There were 63 people. Um, from 60 to 70, there were 40 people. Okay. From 70 to 80, there were 24 people. From 80 to 90, there were five people. Okay? So this is the, del the distribution. The biggest number were between 51 and 60. Does everybody see that? If you got between a 51 and a 60, are you failing in here? I didn't hear that. No. Okay, this is going to be curved. Does everybody see that? Okay. Now, we're going to give these things out once I start, once I tell everybody quiet for a second, because this is complicated. Shh. We won't give them out till we're quiet. No, wait, wait a second. Don't give them out yet. Okay. Quiet. We can't give them out yet. Understand, there will be a curve. Okay. Um, the, uh, what I'm going to do now, the correlation between the first scores on the first part and the multiple choice was a 0.5, which is very good, okay? If they were randomly, people, people who did well on the first part generally did well on the second part. That's what this basically says. People who did badly on the first part did badly on the second part. Okay, so what are we going to do? I'm now going to give these things out, both me and uh, the TA are going to take our people, we're going to read the name once, okay, and that person had better sprint by, grab their paper, and then keep walking. If I skip your name, you do not get another chance at the paper. Is that clear? Okay? So I need you to be here to get these things if we're going to give them out now. Okay, quickly. David Abelson. Thank you. Rakesh Agarwal. Okay, too late. Okay. <laughs> Phil Rahul. Rahul Agatha, okay, Antonio Alberti, okay, and eat faster. Uh, Abadar Akar, okay, good. Kimberly Allen, okay, Edwin Alvarez. Keep moving closer if you're in here. Sumik Bara, okay, Neil Be Behaven, okay, Neil, good, okay. Frederick Brown, good. Aaron Brown, good. Um, Yifang Kao, okay. Taran Karim, keep getting closer if you're near me at the beginning of the seas. Taran Karim. Okay, Scott Carson. Okay, take, take it. Um, uh, Andrea Serini. Okay, Arthur Chan. Okay, got to get closer, got to get closer. Okay, Charles Chen. Good. Samuel Chen. Uh, Seward Chen. Zihan Chen, Zihao Chen, Yang, uh, Yang Hang Chen, is this you? Good. Okay. Yugi Chen. Okay. Peng Chang. Michael Chung. Rishab Ch Chiraba. Uh, got to get closer. You got to be quicker. Kenneth, Ch Kenneth Chigawa. Alexander Chen. Henry Chen. Tamad Chaudhuri. Daniel Cho. Okay, sorry about this. Okay, Michael Citro. Okay, got to be faster. Okay, Patrick Cleary. Got to get closer. See, Sean Clark. Mike, how'd you do? Uh, Nathaniel Clench. And Courtney. Okay, Luke Detauli. Uh, Luke uh, Detulio. Okay, Daniel Dumont. Okay, Kelly Deng. Okay, no one. Okay, Rolando Diaz. Santiago uh, Diego. No. Okay, get closer if you're in the D's. Ruby Dong. Get closer. Stephanie Epp. Okay, Alberto Espanol. Catherine Feldman. Okay, go. Brandon Fuegs. 
Okay, Alexander Flores. Okay. Um, okay, fine. Uh, Thomas Flynn. Uh, okay, fine. Michael Francis. Jeffrey Fu. Get closer if you're in the F's, if you're G's. Ryan Gavin. Okay. Ma Peter Geis. Okay, you got to be closer, closer. Okay, Christopher Giametta. Warren Gold. Lisa Go. Parth Gupta. Anthony Haas. Danny Hahn. Okay, um, Kieran Helgemeyer. Okay, Brian He. Haley He. Okay. Gia He. Zun. Okay, got to be more aggressive. Zun Ji He. Zun. Okay, come. Brian Hilbert. Maharab Hoke. Okay, sorry. Jerry Huang. Jay Huang. Stefan Imminent. Okay. Saeed Jamal. Jimmy G. Sanjeev Jonah. Sanjay Jonah, somebody. Okay. Chung, Chung G. Sahad Kamal. Singdal Kamal. Okay, Benjamin uh, Handoff. Okay, good. Aktash uh, Katu. Okay, Himanshu Katu. Rona, K's get closer. Rona Kenya. Okay, Shane Kennedy. Benito Kestelman. Okay, Manjur Khan. Bum Kim. Boom Kim. N Ho Kim. Jun Ho Kim. Wan Jung Kim. Billy Ko. Zachary Koch. David Komorowski. Um, Chung uh, Tang Kang. William Kong. Kano. Okay, uh, and that's the, okay. The rest of you guys spread it out over here. So any of the rest of you, pick these things up. Okay, good. How are we doing here? Let me take over. Okay, here. Let me do it. I'm faster now. Okay, thanks. Let's just try this. Okay, good. Okay, now you, I need you to get close. That's the whole point here. Lauren... Pride or Prodi. Wen uh, Wen John Q. Okay, good. Christopher Kwan. Good. Naveen Rai. Okay, Bavin uh, Ro Raja. Isaac Ramos. Okay, Jadesh Ranjan. Okay, Arjun Rao. Okay, I don't need here. I need to get closer. Everybody closer. Ryan Rego. Here. Ryan Rego. John Reyes, Luis Reyes, Anthony Ripa, uh, Rasid Setai, Alexa Rockwell, uh, Andrew Ro 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 Beausclair, uh, Ro Ro somebody Russell, okay, Khalid Salem, Edgar Samudo, Daniel Scantarum. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, Krishna, um, okay, good. <laughs> Chen Jung Seo. Justin uh, uh, Schaller. Arnshan Shalid. Marlene Shankar. Nauman Shahzad. Surab Sharma, okay, uh, and, and Marka Shikai, okay, uh, Richard Scozzi, if you're in the S's, get closer, Stephen uh, Simone, get closer, closer, Just Joseph Scufra, Michael Sepazine, Sipa Hyming Sun, 
Oliver Sun. Okay, good. Get closer. Okay, uh, Yi so, so. Harrison Termada. Uh, then got to get closer. I want the T's closer. Tristan Terrasancio. Christopher Torres. Okay, good. Oscar Trevino. Joseph T uh, T Tung. Jake Tusa. Gregory Jeff Jeffrey Vicero. Nikolai uh, Vangala. Uh, Nikolai Wine. Nicholas Wine. Nicol Matthew Weston. Elizabeth Williams. What, Mendy Wu. Warren Wong. Kelvin Wu. Um, Wu. Uh, Ming Ta Ming Somebody Wu. Okay. Sun Wa Wu. Yun Ting Wu. Okay. Marvin Yan. Okay. Brian Yang. Okay. Got to be close. Uh, wise, get closer to me. I get easy to hear. Um, Hanron. How Ron Yang? Simon Yang. Okay. Yishmi Yang. Okay. Get closer. Vladimir Yesvenko. Okay. Noah Young. Okay, get closer. Yin Yu. Zin Yu. Zhang Yu. Zeyang Yu. Okay. Feng Wan. Feng Wan. Sheng uh, Wan Yuan. Sheng Hai Wang Wan. Jared Yuan. Jared Yuan. Okay, Zamir uh, Numir Zakir, Zakir. I've got disease, disease. Zakir. Evan Zaliski. Okay, Tadbo Zhao. Yu Zhao. Victor Zem. Bin, Z Bin Zhao, Jack Zeng, Yushan Zhu, Zilang Zhu, Zi Zhu. Okay, I've got these now. If you're from this category and I didn't call you, your papers are here. Look them up. Okay. No, not yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me, okay, so here, everybody quiet for a second, and let's quiet. Okay, again, sorry for the confusion, the class is very large this time. We, I will uh, go through, at least, do a quick go through, again, we've got right now, um, actually, I've got, according to my mind, I've got five minutes to do the test, review the test, right? Everybody sit down who's interested, we'll review the test quickly. Okay, or what are the important points? Okay. What are the... Oh, you know, the papers... It, okay, if you took the paper late, it will be graded when it's graded. Okay. Now, what is the idea, big picture idea behind these problems? Okay. Problem number one. You were given as input a collection of numbers. Okay. And a target and you want to find the subset of numbers which adds up exa exactly to that target. Now, you're given a magic box that given a set of numbers and a, and a different, and a target number T will tell you which, whether or not there is a subset of numbers that add up to T. That's what's being given. The question is, can you use the black box to find the subset of numbers? This is your knapsack problem, which we talked about early in the semester. How do you use that black box to find whether the numbers are there? Okay, to find out, find something that adds up to it. Okay, the basic thing is you're going to want to go through each of the numbers from one to n and find out whether it is necessary for a subset to be done. Suppose, okay, I uh, have a set of numbers here, okay. My, my original set of numbers from the first number to the last number. And I prove that that can be, my black box will tell me that adds up to a sub, sub of k. 
Then I know there is a subset of numbers here that will add up to k. How do I find it? Well, what if I now ask without the first number in it? OK? If there is still a solution, OK, if I now ask from the numbers from the second number through the nth number, does it add up to k? OK? If, the, if so, then there is a, um, this number isn't necessary. OK, and I can throw it out. I don't worry about it. Suppose I now find that the remaining thing does not add up to k. Then I have to use s sub 1 in a solution. And I now need a solution of these numbers from now on that adds up to k minus s1. Does everybody kind of see that? Yes. OK. Now, again, notice that if you put numbers in and then put them in again and then take them out, you are in grave danger of either using numbers multiple times for correctness. OK? So there is a correctness problem if you leave, put numbers in, OK, and re recognize that you can overcompensate here, OK? Suppose, let's say, I just ask myself, is there a way of doing it when, uh, OK. Again, we're running a little short on time, but let me just make sure what I'm concerned about, OK? It is, I am concerned about if you put something in, and then you ask, is there a subset that adds up to something? You might be using that number twice, once the first time to do it, and once the second time that you're doing it. Does everybody see this? Suppose I want to know, is the numbers 2, OK, uh, 3, and 5, can they add up to be 5? Can they add up to be 4? They can't add up to be 4 unless you use 2 twice. Does everybody see that? And if you do the bookkeeping wrong, OK, as many of you may have done, you're at grave danger of using these numbers multiple times, OK? If there's a number that gave me a true, I am going to remove it because if what's left still adds up to, there's a, still a subset for me. I don't need it, OK? That's the way that I'm doing it, OK? Now, um, so, so, so the concern here is you can very easily come up with things that don't add up to the right target here, OK? What? OK, but OK, again, your goal is to find what the num target number is, OK? My claim is that, 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 it is, that, that, that many of the solutions, the solutions that are wrong generally are wrong because they will sometimes give you claim to find the solution when they, or, or, or find things that don't actually add up to what you want them to, unless you adjust the target right or not, OK? Any questions? OK. Let me move on, because we have a small number of minutes here. Quickly, what was the second problem? The second problem had to do with your sorting, merging sorted lists. You have a bunch of lists that are, um, what you call it, uh, that are um, adding up to, you have, each, you have k lists, each of which is of size n over k. And you, these are all sorted. And you want those lists to merge them into one sorted array. Does everybody see that? OK. Now, what is the, uh, the, I give you three ways to do it. The first takes the first list and merges it with the second list. So this list of size n over k, when merged with it, becomes a list of size 2n over k. Then merge it with one list of size n over k. It will become 3n over k, 4n over k, until they're all merged. Does everybody see what I'm doing? OK. What is the cost of this? It is going to be the sum over a total of k merged.